Hello everybody and welcome back to the Year 2 tutorial series. I'm sorry it's been a while before I've made these videos, but I've just been trying to think about what the most helpful topics would be to cover. And so I want to do a couple of videos, probably have to do two because the topic is quite big, about using databases within Year 2. Now some of this is handled for you automatically and we're going to come back to that later on probably at the end of the second video but I found that when I first came to Yi 2 I found it quite confusing about all the different ways that you could access a database and they seemed kind of similar but they also seemed kind of different so I wanted to work out what was what and then put together what I found into a video. So E2 has three different ways or different flavors of accessing the database which we're going to look at. But before we get there, it's just probably worth pointing out that you need to know something about structured query language, which we sometimes call SQL or SQL. And that is the language that is used for most relational databases in order to get information out of them. So if we look back at our test database, we can see here the list of books. You'll notice that um, I've added a few more books into the list here. I've also added a column called rank, and you'll see why I've added that column in a minute, but that's just to show us how we can do things like sorting. But when we get data from a database, even though we write code in Yi, what the database actually sees is some kind of query language. So for instance, this says select all of the columns, that's what star means, from the table book where one. And where one, you could get rid of that and it would still do the same thing. So if I press go, you can see it's selected five rows, which is all of the rows from the book table. Now, if I go back and change this a bit and I could say where I don't know, title is uh, equal to, I'm just trying to think of one of the titles. Uh, let's go and have a quick look on here and cheat. So if I get a title here, like Paradise Lost, if I go back here and say, select star from book where title equals, um, got to use the right delimiters, hopefully. Uh, unknown column, Paradise Lost, uh, it's probably because I haven't put enough ticks in there. Let's go again, where title equals little, little, little. Unknown column, paradise lost in where clause. Oh, is that, mm. Sorry, it's because back ticks are for objects and quotes are for strings. Um, and if you see here, again, it's selected one row, as you would imagine, that matches the query that I use there. Now there's lots and lots of different things that you can do in SQL and this video is nowhere near long enough to actually cover many aspects of it. But I guess the things that we perhaps need to understand for the purposes of this video is that we can put columns here so we can only select um, things like maybe two columns. We could do that and again we just get two columns instead of everything. And it's usually good practice to only select the columns that you need, and that is just to reduce the amount of network and memory required for that query. And we can uh, do things like we can sort, so we could select, uh, let's just say select star from book, where we don't need a where clause if it's just where one, but we could do things like order by, uh, let's say the title column, Ooh, like that. And if we go there, it's going to order them by title. About a boy, beginning with A, and Paradise Lost, beginning with P, in alphabetical order. So ordering is something we're going to look at. It's, um, I guess, what we would call sorting, usually. Um, in SQL, it's called ordering, or order by. And the other thing we can do is we can limit the number of results that we get. And that's really important in a case where, let's imagine you were running a bookshop here and your books table had, let's say, 200,000 entries in it. 
then if somebody's paging through some search results, you don't want to download 200,000 rows of a database table into your web application. So what you can do, and some of this is done automatically for you, is we can select star from book and we can say limit it to three results. Obviously you could use whatever number you wanted to. We'll say three, and if we do that again, it will just take the top three. Now what's important about the limit clause is that it will work on the default ordering of the rows. So rows are usually ordered by primary key, but that's not always the case. If I go back to browse, um, we can see here that all those look like they've been sorted by title now, probably because of the SQL that I ran. But they will usually be returned in the order that they're specified in their primary key, in this case the ID. But we certainly can't assume that that's true because if we have certain indexes on the table, which again, something you can read about elsewhere, then the order is not certain. So it's always best if we're gonna limit it to three, that we would include both an order by, order by whatever, let's say rank, which we're gonna use later, and then we would limit it to three results. And what that means is, it's gonna order it first on the rank, and then it's gonna only take the top three results. And by doing this, it just means we don't pull everything across the network for the sake of it. So, like I say, I can't really go into much detail about SQL. If you've never seen it before, then really I highly recommend that you watch a video or find a book, just a basic introduction to SQL. There's all manner of things about joining tables together. So you could select something from a book, join it to the author of that book and return columns from both. Um, you can select things like count, so you could select count star from book and that would tell you how many books there are and it says there are five all, all kinds of things like that lots and lots of things you can do but i guess the most important thing to realize here is that a query language is not the same as writing code so in code we used to say you know do something here do something here do something here it all happens in order and you know by the end of our function something has happened but query language is not like that. Query language, you should really think of it as a single statement that encapsulates everything of your grouping into one statement. So all of the columns you need, all of the tables, all of the relationships encapsulated in one concept. Because if you can do that, then it's much easier to write down the SQL. If you think too much like a programmer, you'll write SQL code that's inefficient, that's slow, um, and that we don't really need. So let's kind of leave that there for now and look at the three different flavors of database access in Yi. Now, as I have said before, and I'll say it again, please, please, please start with the Yi2 guide if you're trying to learn stuff. There's sections in here about all kinds of stuff. If you look in section six, you will find stuff on data access objects, which is our first topic, the query builder and active record and I might do either a separate video or might add it on the end to talk about migrations as well. But all of the stuff is in here, and although some of these are very long topics, you don't have to understand everything in there, but this is a really good starting point. Uh, don't jump on the forums and say, you know, how do I create a data access object when the answer is right at the top of here. So just do that, work with that, work with the example code. I'll upload everything from GitHub for my latest project so that you've got everything to look at. But I haven't really made too many changes this time in order to demonstrate some of this stuff. So let's just go back to home again and I'll pop up my NetBeans IDE and the only files that I've changed for this demo are these files here. So let's close some of them down. In sight, because on here I have a, a nav bar, a bootstrap nav bar that's fixed to the top of the page, that means if I scroll, the nav bar stays where it is. What I had to do here was just add some padding to the top of the body, and all that does is pushes all of this down, and it means that if I get rid of that, this jumbotron gray thing is hiding behind the nav bar, which doesn't look very nice, so I've added that. Now, the other thing I then had to do, because one of my last videos, I was talking about assets and asset bundles, I had to remove some of the, the code changes I'd made in app asset, and what I did was I put in site.css. I put that back in because that had been taken out, which is probably why this was broken. So adding site.css back in, 
to appasset.php. Um, you've seen the stuff in sight. And like I mentioned earlier, in here, since the last tutorial video, if I look at the structure, I've added a rank column. And the rank column is purely, uh, you know, like the Amazon rank. So if you go to Amazon and look at the books, it says this book is ranked number 15 or 200 or 300,000 or whatever. It's how popular the book is. And I've added that just to demonstrate the idea of sorting and of limiting things. So I've added that in, and if we look at the table, I've just put some random numbers in there. They don't mean anything. They just give us the, the ability to sort. And if you look at the minute, uh, this, this data is sorted by rank. You can see that little arrow there. And so Fever Pitch is the highest ranked book in my fake list, and High Fidelity is the lowest ranked one. So we're gonna come back to that in a second. So in my book model, all I've done is added the magic property back in um, and also added the display name of rank. We don't actually display that anywhere. I've just added that in for completeness. And because rank would never be set from the front end of the website, I haven't bothered putting any rules in there. Um, really what I should do is uh, mark it as unsafe and that will mean that it's not allowed to be set from a submitted form because otherwise people could hack it. But um, other than that, I haven't changed anything in book. All I've really done here is I want to basically demonstrate what it's like to list the most popular books in this section here. Uh, it doesn't matter that it's on this page. I just chose this page because it's already there and I have a little section to put it in. So what do we need to know to do that? Well, first of all, let's just look at the user interface parts of it because once we've looked at that, the user interface stuff doesn't change very much at all um, for looking at the different types of database access. So we're going to um, look at that in a second. So to begin with, let's just take out that code that's there. Probably comment that out. Will that work? Yep. So get rid of the bit that says heading. Get rid of that stuff. And what I'm going to do, um, I've got lots of uh, comments in here because it's a bit messy when you mix PHP and HTML. Okay, so what I've done here, oh, got another comment in there, is I put a title which is just top books and underneath the top books, I've used something called a list view, which is a widget. And the list view is designed to display several items of the same type by using a template. And so the template here is something called underscore book. And all I've done in here is I've posted the title of the book and the rank of the book. Normally we wouldn't necessarily display rank, maybe we would. I've just put it in there just to make it obvious what's going on. So that's all that is. You can see that's just really a partial piece of HTML. It's just a single div. In that case, it's got um, a class in there, but I didn't put that in there, so I'm not gonna use that. And you notice the only other thing that's changed here is we have to specify where this list view is gonna get its data from. And we tell it it's gonna get its data from this data provider, which if we just squiz up the top here, we'll see we have a data provider variable, and that variable to begin with is of type array data provider. And you see these are commented out, but these are just kind of magic properties, so the stuff wires up properly. So that's all we have to do in there. So the only question is now, how do we wire all of that stuff up? Um, and why have I got that there for, um, what one is that, books index, no, ignore that. So the question is how we wire this thing up in the site controller. So let's go back a bit and talk about the first type of database access. Um, the, now the first type, as you saw in the guide, is called uh, data access objects. We call it DAO sometimes. And what you should understand to begin with is that DAO is not a ye specific thing. It is a standard database pattern. And all it really means is they're gonna encapsulate database access in a number of objects. So that rather than just writing lots of long strings containing SQL, what we'll do instead is we'll create some simple objects. We can call methods on those objects and those methods will either return data if we're querying the database or you know, we'll update or delete data if we're doing that instead. 
So data access objects are not really very difficult to understand. They're quite low level, they're quite clunky. We'll see an example in a second. And really all they enable us to do is provide a very, very thin layer on top of the database itself. Obviously in this case, in the PHP framework, it allows us to write the code in PHP. Obviously, if you had a data access objects model in .NET, it would be in a .NET language. If it was in Java, it would be in a Java language. So it allows you to access database using the language that you're writing your framework in. And again, that just makes it slightly easier, perhaps, than learning lots and lots of uh, different language that you would need for SQL. So if we look at a very simple example, the database connection itself will be set up in your app by default. You've already seen that. That's in the configuration. So you have, oh, it'll be in the DB in this one, in there. So we have a uh, DB connection that's already set up. And what happens is that will be assigned into a variable called DB, which you might have seen in code somewhere. So we're just going to use that, which is nice and easy. And if you look here, um, DB is set to point to the contents of that file, which we just looked at. So that's all nice and easy. So we don't need to worry about the connections bit. But if you look at a, kind of the first real kind of simple example is you get the DB, you call create command. And inside that command, you can either put some raw SQL like this. You can also call a stored procedure inside this create command and you can put in parameters in a where clause. So in this case, where the ID number equals one. So clearly in that case, that's probably going to return one result, whereas that would return lots of results. You can also bind parameters to it. So if you, for instance, here you want um, an ID to match the ID that you've typed in, then what you can do is you can call bind value on the um, object that gets returned from create command and bind value you tell it bind that parameter which you specified there with a colon they have to have colons in to this value in this case the id that's coming on the query string now that's not necessarily a very secure way to do this but it gives you an idea of what's going on in this case there's also a second parameter and that's bound just to a hard-coded one. So in this case, select any posts of the ID that's been requested where the status is one. So you can see here, there isn't really very much functionality that you're getting for free. You're really just still having to type in most of the SQL, but then you get to bind values. And then most importantly, by the end of that, in order for that to actually execute, you either need to call query all, query one, query column, query scalar. And what these do, query all returns a collection, an array of rows of data. So if you're selected, uh, expecting more than one row, or if it's possible that you will have more than one row, then you should call query all and you'll get an array. If you know there's only going to be one, then you can call query one. And so you get a row back instead of a collection of rows. So that's just a little bit simpler. Query column takes the first column back from the results. So rather than getting everything. So here, if you look, they only select one uh, field from the table. And as a result, they're only going to have one column. So again, rather than querying all and getting a collection of rows, you can instead get uh, an array that's running in a different direction with every a value of every entry from that select statement as a separate array entry. And then query scalar is used if you have any kind of pr procedure or code that returns a single value rather than data. So in this example, you're returning a count. That's just going to be a number like we saw earlier. So if you're calling count star, query scalar will return that value. And again, you'll get that rather than getting that in a generic data format, you will get that in a typed object. So that will come back as an integer, which again, is obviously much easier for you to use uh, in a variable that looks like that. So that's kind of really quite pretty much it in terms of the basics of it. There is one other thing, uh, sorry, execute is another method that you can call if you are not expecting to return any data. So in this case, if you update something, update doesn't return 
data by default, what it does return is the number of rows that have been changed. So execute does return the number of rows. You don't have to use it, but that might be useful for you. You might detect if zero rows have been updated, you might throw an error. If more than one row is updated and you're not expecting it, then you might throw an error as well. Um, but in, in general, um, this is all kind of fairly noddy. Now, the other thing is they have given you uh, a couple of helper functions. You'll see they've got an update, a delete, a batch insert, and also an insert method. Well, sorry, that's there as well. And again, what these do is, is just saves you typing a little bit of SQL. So rather than typing um, insert into user brackets name age values Sam 30, which would be the full SQL. So that would look something like, um, just make sure it's still running. So we would do something like, um, yeah, well, there, there's, there's the kind of code that you would see insert into table that column, that column, that column, that column, that column, these values, one, two, three, four. So that's, you know, quite a lot of SQL. It's not impossible, but clearly this is a lot neater. Tell it the table name, tell it what field needs to have what value, and then call execute, and that will do that for you. Same with update, update this table, set, and again, you can have an array in there of different things to set. And then in this case, if the age is greater than 30, then that's the condition to run the update. And again, same with delete, delete rows from this table, and that's the condition if status equals zero. And again, the execute runs that and returns the number of rows effective, uh, affected. Batch insert, I'll let you read that for yourselves, but effectively it's calling insert lots of times in one, one go, so you don't have too many, um, too many SQL statements. And something that's really important to get used to is um, letting ye handle the quoting of your objects. So for instance, if I'm writing something in here, you've probably already seen it anyway. If I do select um, title from book, so I press go, that works. But you see these back ticks here. My SQL uses back ticks to highlight where this is the name of a field or a table, some kind of object, rather than a piece of text. So you saw earlier where I got it wrong and I, I, you know, I did this equals, you know, that. And that's wrong because that's looking for a column called that. So strings in my SQL um, are delimited with single quotes as they are in Microsoft SQL Server. But in, in SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server, objects are not quoted with back ticks. They're quoted with square brackets instead. So what you don't want to do is have in your code select count from employee, but if it's MySQL, I want to add back ticks. If it's SQL Server, I want to add square brackets. You don't want to do that because that's just going to be messy. So ye will do that automatically for you. So if you put your column names into double square brackets like that, and if you put your table names into double curly brackets like that, then ye will automatically put the correct type of quotes. As you can see here, the example from MySQL will do that. And if you called it on SQL Server instead, then it would quote them differently. And the other thing that you should also add in, again, as a good habit, is the percent symbol in front of the table name. And what that means is if you've set up a table prefix for your uh, database, which you might or might not have done, then putting the percent there will make sure that that gets added. You can add the percent sign even if this is blank, because if it's blank, that still works. It just doesn't add anything on the front. But what it means is if you do ever change your database or if you do ever add a table prefix, you don't have to search through all of your code and try and find everywhere it's been referenced. Um, most of the other stuff in here, I don't think is really worth mentioning at this point. We'll come up to some of it later on. Um, I guess we might as well mention this working with database schema. So database schema is really just how you describe um, a, a database. So when you add tables, when you drop tables, when you add columns and stuff, what you're doing is you're changing the schema of the database. And data access objects offers you all of these functions, or certainly in the Yee version of it, it does, to actually be modifying your database. 
Now, obviously, things like ghee. We've seen ghee before, haven't we? That's um, don't know how I've set up my how I've set up my thing at the minute. Is it? Uh, that? Well, I can't remember. Anyway, you've seen the graphic interface to create um, objects in the database. So clearly these have a use, but of course you must be really careful when you're calling these things um, in, that you don't call them at the wrong time because if you drop a table, you lose all of the data in that table and there is no undo in databases. Uh, you can have a backup and that's fine, but if you drop a table, you lose everything and that's it. So be really careful if you're using these. If you have an admin area, then create a, se a separate part of the website's probably the best idea. And then you could create a different database user with more permissions and you can lock down that part of the website uh, much more strongly than the main part of your website. Just think about those kind of things when you do this. Otherwise, it'd be very, very easy to come and bite you later on and dropping a table that can be a disaster so you really don't want to go there so that's really all there is to data access objects like i say it's a very thin layer over the top um, of of the database itself so let's look at how this might work so initially the default code for our front page in the site controller the index just returns the index view that had all the hard-coded stuff on there um, so do you remember that had, where are we? That's not going to work now because I've just commented it out. Um, that's not going to work anyway. Sorry, I'll show you that again in a minute. So let's uncomment our first block. And this block is the data access objects block. So if you see here, that DB is what I mentioned earlier. That comes from the configuration. That comes from the DB file that's created by default when you create your basic template. It has something very similar in the advanced template, but you might have separate database connections for the front and back end. In fact, you can have as many connections as you want, but by default you get one and it's called DB. And so we grab that and then we call create command. And then I have some, basically some hard coded SQL. If you look there, nothing special at all. Select star. So remember I said that that's not usually a good idea, but select all columns from book. And again, notice I've angle, um, curly brackets and put the percent there for the table. And then I'm going to order by the rank column. And again, square brackets around that to make sure it's quoted properly. And then I want to limit it to three. And then what I have to do with that data, so that's a fairly low level, what I'm going to end up with is a command. And then I have to attach that into this array data provider. Now the array data provider is pretty much what it sounds like. It's just really a storage class for an array. And we set something called all models and all models gets assigned the result of that command. So I call qu query all on this because I expect there to be more than one result. And I assign the results of that into all models. And then all we use this for is to pass into the view and then inside the view, that's going to be assigned to this data provider, which gets assigned to the widget. And the widget calls that little view that we had earlier for every item within that data provider. So that's all kind of pretty noddy and I hope it's going to work because I did try it earlier. So if you see here, Fever Pitch is our top book at 543. Let's just go and check that. It's correct. And I expect Frankenstein and Paradise Lost. Frankenstein, Paradise Lost. So that works. Obviously, I could make that look a bit nicer. Um, you see here, it automatically also shows that, even though I didn't want it to, but who cares? You know, we, we can kind of change all, all of that later on. But let's see what happens. If I get rid of um, the order by, and I go back again, what's going to happen now is you see these have come out in whatever order they happen to have come out in. Now I suspect if I order them by ID, oh, can't fucking do that. ID, click to sort. That didn't sort it at all, did it? No, so I would expect Paradise Lost probably is the first one because that's ID two, then Frankenstein, then Fever Pitch. So normally they will come out in order of the primary key, which is there. 
but like I said earlier don't rely on the order they're going to come out make sure you put this in order by limit of three obviously if I want more I can up that to five and I get five instead so there's nothing really magic there but you would tend to use this really well you wouldn't use data access objects directly very often there are time when I've used it I've used it in an API and the reason I've used it in the API is because you don't need a model for it to work with so notice here I'm not using the book model and that makes this kind of probably a bit faster because I'm not pulling in lots and lots of objects that are um, part of the active record classes we will look at active record later so this is kind of quite a quick way of handling lots and lots of data and so you might use it in low level functionality you might use it if you need to do something very quickly but in general we don't do much of this stuff directly although Yi itself does lots of this under the covers because if you dig down deeply enough into active record you will find all of this stuff being called at the lowest level so that is data access objects you're not going to use it very much but hopefully that's now going to give us a bit of a foundation to move on to have a quick look at query builder now the query builder again if we pop back to the guide here um, wherever I was working with databases again there's a page on query builder really I'm not going to go through loads of it because it's lots of the same thing all that query builder really is is a way of avoiding writing lots of SQL in that way and replacing these kind of pieces with methods so if I just uncomment this second bit you'll get an idea of what this looks like so query builder really is all based on this class virtually everything you use is a method on this query class which is in ye database or ye db namespace and you'll notice here here's an example you can do the new in brackets i've done it just as a separate thing doesn't really matter and you'll notice here that whereas before oh i'm gone whereas before we had select from order by limit etc you'll notice what happens here is select is a method from where limit and then like the dao we have to execute it by calling either all or one at the end of it depending on whether we expect um, lots of rows or just one row and so if we look at the same thing here query from i mean select is kind of implied you can tell it what columns to select but i'm not going to bother with that i'm just going to say from book so we've got that bit and again i could probably quote that i'm guessing um order by what column do i need here i order by rank there that's that bit and then limit three limit five whatever we want and again i want to call all because i'm going to get um, more than one result and notice again i'm using the same array data provider setting all models in exactly the same way so this isn't a lot different from the dao the only real difference is it's giving me methods instead uh, i'm going to render it all in the same way and with any luck if i go back to here and refresh the front page i've got my list again except i've only got three items because i've limited it to three so one of the reasons why these methods are very helpful is of course it avoids getting things wrong like spaces like is order by two words or is it one word or you know is the limit is limit five in brackets is it not in brackets you avoid all of those things and to be honest they're often the biggest cause of bugs in software silly things like that that the compiler can't check for you if you're writing it inside a string the compiler doesn't know what you're typing there whereas when you use a method it can very easily say well limit I expect limit to take an integer that's the only thing it should take because you would only ever pass it a number so all I have to care about is the number and I'll let ye and the framework worry about how that's actually going to build that string so it's much neater very similar in that it's not attached to the book model so this is not active record this is just purely um, really DAO with a few extra methods but it is worth um, looking through this query builder stuff because as well as normal things like select from where that's all kind of obvious 
but you've got things like how to add parameters to your where clause. So where status equals some kind of value, and then you call add params in order to stick it. Um, you know, where clauses that have multiple things in there is all in there. Um, you've also got things like if you want to use operators rather than just equals, if using things like greater than, less than, those kind of things, then again, you can use this kind of format. And that says, I want age to be greater than 10. Not quite sure why they're in this order, but don't, don't forget they're in that order. And you can see in uh, the other thing that you can do is you can use and where as well. And that's useful because you glue on another piece of where clause and it allows you to use one format for one part of the where clause. That's just value equals value. But the and where allows you to then use this different format that you say, but I also want my title to be like the search term. So there's kind of cool stuff in here. Um, it's not a massive article. Order by, again, you oh, probably didn't want to click that. You can find order by group by again this is all stuff you'll learn in sql um, having limits offsets all kinds of stuff uh, even joining so again joining is a big thing in sql lots of your stuff will do a join if you use active record which we'll look at in the next video then the joins are handled for you and you don't have to think about them but at some point you're going to have to learn the syntax for join and how you join tables together and again, there's a function to do that just to avoid you typing it all out yourself. Union is when you get two different data sets and you join them together. So here, like the example is I want all this stuff from post, but I also want this stuff from user and I want to union them. So it allows you to create one data set from two usually slightly different pieces of data. Um, that can be handy. And then uh, similar methods to what we had on the DAO. We can call all or one of the usual ones. Column, probably don't call it too often, but again, you could call a column on, let's say, a load of usernames, and then you could use that to populate a list of usernames. So it's, it's maybe handy in some instances. Scalar is a single value. Um, exists is a special one, which again, because it actually has its own... Um, its own syntax in SQL so you could do if exists um, I think the syntax is correct select start from um, book where one I don't know do something like that um, if exists then um, select one else select two I don't know something like that no, of course, of course, I've got it wrong. Um, but if you see, because exist is like a special keyword in the query build, it also has its own method. Um, and again, that's useful for saying, are, are there any um, results from this query? I, I don't necessarily need the data. I just want to know. So things like, does this username already exist? Um, is there already a post called this or, you know, written by this person or whatever you might want to build up? Um, count, as we've seen before, again, just performs a count of the things, of the results. And also your aggregation function. So you can add things together, but of course, the difference with something like adding stuff together is you have to tell it what you want it to add together. So you could say add together all of the ages from the users table or average all of the user ages. So they take an extra parameter, but... Again, that's all. it's all documented in here. There's nothing really too tricky to understand. But the important thing is most of this stuff is based on the idea that you understand SQL already. If you don't understand SQL, then you're not going to make sense of a lot of these things. Um, another thing that's worth mentioning, I'm not going to go into great detail because, again, I think you, you'll be able to do it yourself very easily once you get to this point. But batch query, again, is a way of avoiding... Uh, getting lots and lots of um, query results at the same time. And again, imagine if you go to a site, let's just go to I don't know, anywhere, amazon.co.uk, and let's see if we search for kind of, I don't know, Lion King or whatever, and I do search. Now, there's obviously going to be loads and loads and loads and loads of results, yeah? And if I scroll down here, you'll see, you know, 20-odd pages, maybe more, of Lion King results. So 
clearly what I don't want to do is when somebody types Lion King, I don't want to return 20 pages of results in one go because it's just going to be a waste. And most people probably only look at the first page, maybe the second page. They don't scroll through every single page. So why load them all in one go? Why not load them one at a time? When I click on that, then I can just load the second page um, from database and just save all of that time. It's called batch querying. And again, what you can do here is by calling this batch function, and you've got a couple of different ways to do it, but uh, by calling batch, what you can do, the default size is 100. So if you query batch as users, then you get 100 um, or less. If there, are, if there aren't 100 users in the users table, you get 100 or less rows. But then what happens is if they hit a page button, you can then call query batch again, and it will get you the next lot. Um, and then you can just page through stuff like that. So again, just reducing the overhead of it. But the thing with most optimizations is you don't do them to begin with, unless you know that it's definitely gonna become a big problem, then you worry about these things afterwards when they start becoming slow. Um, otherwise you can spend forever making stuff quick. And maybe it's already quick. Maybe the database already does this automatically. So, you know, don't don't get don't go too mad trying to put all of this stuff in from the beginning. But yeah, that's really all that Query Builder is. So it's not really a separate way of doing stuff. Um, it's just really a, a pattern, a set of helper methods in order to help you select data. Um, and again, a bit like the DAO, you don't use it massively often because again, it doesn't use the active record classes, doesn't use the models, which means that you lose a lot of functionality, but at the same time, it's quicker because you, you haven't got all the overhead of the model system. So again, you might use it in APIs, you might use it in data analysis, you might use it in transactions that do a, a lot of data querying. Um, and you can use it even within your active record classes, although usually there'll be an easier way to do it, um, effectively by replacing that front bit with something from active record, and then the rest of it works in a similar way, which we'll look at in the next video. But I think that's enough kind of database stuff for now. Um, I'll do a second video for the active record um, in a bit, but um, yeah, hopefully that kind of explains a little bit about the, the foundations for the database in Yi. As you can see, I haven't had to write much code in order to make it work, and that's because the database is already specified anyway, and then all I have to do is either call it a bit like this, call it a bit like this, um, and you can see, you know, you can build up very complex queries here, but really most of the time you'll spend using the active stuff, the active record pattern, um, but that's a much bigger topic, which is why I'm going to do it in a separate video. Um, but if you have any comments or questions, please put them in the comments below. Um, my code hasn't changed too much from last time. I did add something called a tunnel that I invented into this system. I think I've deleted it, but if you find a few little bits knocking around in the um, in the application somewhere when you download this from GitHub, um, don't worry about it. It's probably just stuff that's a, a hangover. Um, but otherwise, I look forward to seeing you in the next video.